few filmmakers achieve a style so recognizable that a still frame is enough to pop their name into your head within milliseconds. Some argue they got style over substance, but is a film's unique and interesting appearance not part substance anyway, elevating the written material? Well, French director Jean Biogeny certainly is one of the most celebrated stylistic filmmakers to ever project their visions on the big screen. He let us peek into the lives of surreal, charming, sad, disturbing and weird people. Their work, hobbies, thoughts and dreams lasts what they like and what they don't. Do you hear it? Ah, Julie plays the cello again. The whole apartment building listens, the music travels through the pipes. Madame Tapioca beats the dust out of her carpet while her husband pumps up a tire. His mother-in-law is knitting beside him. Louison, the new janitor, paints the ceiling. Roger and Coubet are working. The pace quickens faster and faster until we reach the climax. Literally. Clapé is his name, the butcher, played by Jean-Claude Trefus, our antagonist. It isn't easy living nowadays. Corn replaced whatever currency has been utilized before. Food in general is rare. The worst bursts out of the remaining humans, various of which became cannibals. Vegetarian rebels called troglodytes dwell in the sewers deep under a broken world, a post-apocalyptic world. Throughout his filmography, Genet drops the viewers into fantastical worlds or reality interwoven with fantastical elements. His world building and plot happen concurrently. We only learn about aspects with personal significance to the characters. His world building is clearly character centric. The world itself isn't as important as the characters that are breathing life into it. What caused the world's decay or how many humans are still left? Unanswered. We don't need to know. Delicatessen weaves dark themes through a charming, humorous story, never being buried by its darkness. At its core, Delicatessen tells a story of goodness, how virtue can indirectly affect your surroundings. Louison, wholesomely played by Dominique Pignon, embodies this pure goodness, sparking a chain reaction of incredible events. Sometimes, simply being good is more than enough to make a difference. The same can't be said about La Cité des Enfants Perdus. One, played by Ron Perlman, is a purely good person, once more contrasted against a nefarious and unforgiving world. But one's influence is much more direct, even though not consciously, rather instinctively chosen. When his little brother gets kidnapped, like countless children before, he begins his search, willing to do anything to rescue Don Ré. The film is set in a steampunk-esque port city, with winding, contorted streets and alleyways enclosed by endless, deep ocean, rusty and decrepit. Children are thieving and the adults seem lost, seeking fulfillment either through material goods, religion, drugs, or by playing God. An inventor living on a lonely oil rig far off the shores once created a princess ought to be the most beautiful woman to ever walk the ground and six clones after his own image, for he had neither a wife nor children. To keep him company, he bred a brain, putting it in an aquarium and his masterpiece, the most intelligent man alive. But every single creation had a flaw. The princess was dwarfish, the clones had a sleep sickness, the brain pained by migraine and the man called Kronk, German for sick, couldn't dream. Grief consumed him, aging him rapidly and angrily they opposed the scientist, their creator, and threw him in the sea. A classic trope, parallelling for example Frankenstein. Stripped in a machine, Kronk experiences the innocent dreams of the stolen children, yet they morph into nightmares every time. Forever he'll be deprived dreaming a real dream. One may be our protagonist, but the story told belongs to Kronk. My fascination with this painterly world sprung from the minds of Jeunet and Marc Caro seems never ending. None compare, stylistically one of a kind, Brazil might be the closest thing to it. The city of lost children really is something special. The next film in Jeunet's filmography is... Now let me show you. Um... 
Les Fabuleux Destines de Amélie Poulain. Surely his most famous work, Amélie represents Junis' definite directorial culmination. Everything that came before is here, expanded, reworked, reused, and or improved. A narrator sets the scene. The eccentric characters are explored through their affections and dislikes, giving them complexity and personality in seconds, very much resembling Forte's Junis' 1989 released short film, which had already used that concept to great effect. I love this way of character introduction. They immediately feel like real people with quirks and habits. You may find they enjoy or dislike the same things as you, creating a sort of personal connection. And we must get a feel for all these characters so we understand Amelie's impact on their lives when she chooses to involve herself. This is the third part of Junie's reoccurring motif of goodness's influence. We'd seen it indirectly and partially direct, but instinctively influence. Now we see it directly, intentionally influence. Louis saw being good was quite enough. One acted out of instinct, but Amélie makes a conscious decision to take part in the lives of all those people around her, the people of Montmartre. Amélie's Paris is soaked in greens and reds, oftentimes accented with carefully placed blue, a scheme of complementary colors, lending the film a distinct and pleasing look. This color scheme was also used in Delicatessen, in La Cité, the Enfant Perdu, though in slightly different form and not as extreme an implementation. In those films, green was contrasted with yellowish, orangish and reddish tones, and blue was seldom used, only a handful of times. We explore a Paris of wonders, a Paris warped by Amélie's imagination, this isn't supposed to represent reality. The film itself knows that it is just a film. Amélie even breaks the fourth wall, talking to the viewers directly. When Amélie guides the blind man through the streets, describing him his surroundings in detail and with infectious delight, he gets to experience what we, the viewers, are already experiencing, seeing through Amélie's eyes. A world of talking photos, living paintings, adventurous secrets, traveling garden gnomes and prompters in cellar windows helping out shy people that don't know what to say. And all of it underlaid with a whimsical and beautiful soundtrack. Honestly one of the best soundtracks ever, I often listen to it while writing. Composed by Jan Thiersen, fitting perfectly, Thiersen's music creates the atmosphere of a modern fairy tale. Just listen for a bit. Okay, I continue. The camera work is active, whipping around, zooming in, always moving about, becoming a character all on its own. Genet is a director not with one, but seemingly endless aces up his sleeve. Whenever he uses CGI, it's creatively, selling a shot which couldn't work otherwise to heighten its emotional effect or to visualize what can't be seen, for example a person's thoughts like this scene in Mi'kmaqs. Amélie melting away as a teardrop and the torn pieces of the mystery man's photo reassembling themselves on his face are utterly brilliant, never gimmicky. Since then, Genet showed us the horrors of World War I in combination with a hopeful outlook. A family of homeless single-handedly fighting two weapon manufacturers in Paris, a boy genius embarking on a journey through North America and a 2045 in which humanity depends completely on androids. I'm clueless how to end this video, so I say this. Junet isn't a fast working director, years and years divide his projects, but whenever he releases something new, it's worth the wait. You can expect something stylish, interesting and full of character, and I take that over a generic installment in a long running franchise any day.